Welcome back to the Rock Climbing Podcast, where we not only talk about rock climbing, but expose the frauds. Today, we're going to talk about Alec Honnold. How are his hands so sticky? How is he able to climb up Half Dome with no ropes? How is he able to be such a good free soloer? Is it because of a dark underground rock climbing pedophilia ring that he's a part of? More to come on this show after our break. <clears throat> and then and then my dream for this podcast is that we then have like a 40 minute break with like a whole ton of commercials. Some of them I am in, which makes you wonder and kind of confirm, hey, this is definitely just part of the podcast. He's sort of just doing a new bit now where there's a ton of commercials. And some of them are like really funny. And I spent a lot of time on them just making good sketches that kind of parody commercials. And some of them are fully a high production Carl's Jr. commercial that I am also in. So then you're wondering like, well, wait, are some of these real sponsors because they're done so well and they're not like wacky or crazy or anything? So has this show sold an almost record amount of ad space because that's really the end goal for the podcast is to sell more ad time than any other podcast that's ever been had i mean the goal is about 55 minutes of ads and five of conversation and <clears throat> i mean with the support that we have now we are fucking on the way you know so that's something to get excited about um other than that, the Super Bowl is coming up, and I still don't know about football. I get surprised at how little I know about football. I was having a football conversation last night, which was really just me asking the most basic questions of what is indeed happening in the NFL. And I was like, I would love if the Raiders went up or no not the Raiders if the Ravens went up against the Bills in the Super Bowl and then the guy I was talking to was like that can't happen that's not a possibility but they could fight for the AFC East and if I'm wrong about anything I just said I don't know why you would expect me to be right about it I don't know what it is. I don't know how you get football knowledge seems like fractions where that was like something I needed to pick up as a kid. And now that I'm an adult getting into it, uh, you just become a nerd. I think that's how it works. I think if you because I played football when I was younger, I played flag and tackle and, you know, I liked football. I did not watch it a lot. And I didn't come from a football family, so there's nobody teaching me football. But yeah, if you learn about it as a kid and you play it your whole life, then you're a football guy. And you can just talk about it <clears throat> and like just spew vast amounts of stats, really just statistical information. You just you have all this sort of math knowledge in you, but it's totally normal and casual. If you try and get into football as an adult, you become not a football guy. You become a stats guy to where people are having a normal football conversation. And then you're like, yeah, well. The 2007 Ravens defense reminded me a lot of the 1977 uh, Vikings defense. And then people are like, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess that is true. You know, you almost, you almost sound like a little kid where it's like you have information that's like kind of impressive, but it's not cool. You know, it's like a little kid driving over a bridge, but he reads a lot of big books. So he's like, this bridge was built in 1920s by the Roosevelts. And then everybody in the car is like, wow. And then that's what it feels like. Because now if I ever have any information on football, like any, any new things going on, and then I talk about it with friends of mine that are into football, I don't sound like I am telling them information on equal footing I kind of it's almost like show and tell where it's like look at this football fact that Cooper was able to ascertain and I I'm kind of presenting the fact and then really I'm just sort of waiting for them to uh, respond in a way that validates that fact 
as a worthwhile and interesting thing to say. And so I just want them to go, oh, really? Damn. And kind of act like it's not a big deal that I know that. But then the problem is they go, oh, really? Damn. And then they say something else. They say like another fact of equal importance of what I just said. And for them, that's really easy. They have a lot of those facts. I only got one. So I say that. And then they say something. And then I'm like, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, Aaron Rodgers is gay. You know, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what to say at a certain point. But, uh, I mean, I love it a lot. And you can't... I don't know how to explain that I do love football. But I like watching it in general. Like, I think I'd be pretty okay just watching like a random game from 1970 like I think I could get excited about that you know what I mean then again I like when it is happening live you know but but th I don't really need to know anything you know like you can just come to me and be like it's important for these two teams to win this game and then I probably mostly based on color uh will just pick pick a team to win if I'm just like all right that one's blue We'll do that, you know, and then you, you pick them to win. But, you know, I don't know. I uh, What's his name on the Ravens? Jamar Davis? That guy rules. I think I said his name wrong, but I know who he is, and I like him. And that's where I'm at with football, where if somebody brings him up in my head, I go, that's a guy I like. You know, if somebody brings up Kirk Cousins, I go, he seems like a nice guy. That is my football and all. I kind of, the thing is, I like football the way a football guy's girlfriend likes football. Where, like, I like Kirk Cousins a lot, but it's just because I think he's a nice guy. I just saw a quarterback documentary, which I talked about on this podcast. But I just saw a quarterback documentary, and he just had some kids and a wife, and he loved God a lot. And I'm not a Christian guy, but I think it's nice when people really find a lot of comfort in, in Jesus or whatever. So I was watching that, and I was like, this just seems like a nice guy. I like him a lot. And then I bring him up to my football friends who have been watching football for a while and are very aware of Kirk Cousins, but more just as a player, you know, just as a face and the guy that has led teams they've watched. And I tell my friend, and he's like, he's a fucking bum. He doesn't know how to win a goddamn championship. I'm like, what a mean thing to say about a family man, you know? Because in my mind, it's like Kirk, you know? He's almost like, he's like a, he's like a uncle I haven't met, you know? He's just out there being a nice guy. And I think that's great that he gets to make millions of dollars <clears throat> playing football. It's also, I don't know. I think also, I'll say it like this, is like, if you are if you get too into the Grateful Dead, you can ruin the Grateful Dead for yourself. Because there are people that show up to shows and they're like, they didn't play this specific song and they should have played West LA Fade Away. They were at Dodger Stadium. What the hell? You know, and they can really ruin it. And sometimes they can see a good show and they can be like, that was good, but I don't really like when Bobby's doing that one specific thing that only I notice, you know. And that happens in football, too, where, you know, it's just like if you watch it enough, you kind of forget that all these guys are really good at football. And, you know, they're probably trying their best. And if you made a documentary about any of them, it would be a great documentary because becoming a starting NFL quarterback, is you have to be, you know, you're an interesting guy. There's something about you that got you there. And what's even interesting is sometimes people have just enough to get them there and nothing left to really perform anything else, you know. I guess the greatest, I don't know, one of the greatest examples of that is kind of like Johnny Manziel, where, like, he was just, he was just a party boy in college, didn't read any plays, but was just good enough in college that he was good enough you know, more than good enough. He turned around an entire school's program, but then good enough to get the NFL and then really not good enough to do anything. Just to not to do a single thing, really, in the NFL. And that and they made a whole documentary about that guy, and I watched it, and it was really interesting. But yeah, you watch too much football, and then you look at a guy like Kirk Cousins, and you're like, ah, oh, he's a dumbass. And then you watch the documentary, and you're like, this guy is practicing plays every Thursday. He is really, he's trying to memorize this stuff. He's got like five kids. It's crazy he's doing this. Especially old quarterbacks, you know? Like you just got Joe Flacco. 
I think that guy actually has five kids. Kirk Cousins might all Kirk Cousins might have more than five kids. Then you got Joe Flacco and like there's that picture that's trending of him now online when he's just on the bench and he's he's like just so fucking tired. But he's like tired in like an old man way, you know, like in a way that like kind of looks like he deserves it, you know, because like there's like a 22 year old next to him that's also really tired. But you're like, hey, man, you're going to go out after this and fuck. You know what I mean? Joe Flacco is going to go home and he's going to like make himself a grilled cheese at night. And like like his wife didn't make him any dinner. And it's and it's not like they have a bad relationship or anything. They have a great relationship. It's like he's played football for a long time to the point that like sometimes he comes home from a game and it's kind of like coming home from work. And it's actually not sad. It's not like he comes home and he's like, I'm fucking Joe Flacco. I don't get a meal. You know, it's sort of like, it's almost nice. You know, it's it's almost a hint of normalcy. You know, it almost feels like he's coming home from a regular job and they don't live this sort of sometimes unstable, scary, tumultuous life, you know? You know, it's not like now he has become the starting quarterback for the Browns later in his career and put on quite a showing, you know? He's just Joe. And maybe that's what keeps him level-headed, you know? But that's also why football is cool, because you have a 45-year-old quarterback, and he's passing it to, like, a 21-year-old wide receiver. And they have vastly different lives, but they're playing for the same goal and there's something that feels like they should be in separate leagues but the fucking guy can do the job I mean there's also reasons for that is you don't have a 45 year old wide receiver you know usually the old motherfuckers are like a quarterback because you're just sort of you're you're just back there but that's even scarier because it's like those guys yeah they're not like running around a lot, but it's also one of the most dangerous positions because you're always, every single play, you're the guy that they're trying to fuck up, at least for a couple seconds when you still have the ball in your hand. Which is crazy because, like, you know, I think of my dad, and he's, like, 60 now. I don't think he would do very well in the NFL. And then when my dad was 40, he was a regular guy. And, of course, he wasn't as fit as NFL quarterbacks. But it's also just crazy to think of, like, my I still thought of my dad as an old man when I was, like, five. And he was only, like, 40. But thinking of that fucking guy having to go and get tackled, and of course, everybody listening, and me, is is thinking the obvious thing, is, well, he's a therapist and a pharmaceutical rep. He's not an NFL football player. There's a big difference between those guys. There is. But also, that difference gets a little smaller when you just add in old age that affects them both, where it's like, yeah, Joe Flacco is way more physically fit than anyone in my entire bloodline has ever been. But at the same time, he still suffers from similar things. Like, he's got a weird knee, I'm sure. Maybe even a bad one. But he still has to play football. That's what's crazy. Is like, you can be more physically fit, but inevitably you can't really escape just sort of natural downturn of your body. Something's just going to be weird. Your hands are going to hurt when it gets cold, or your elbows are going to click. You're going to have something. And still, you have to play football. That's what's crazy. That's what's, it's the same problem some old dudes have, but different problems where he still has to get up and play football. And even when he's not playing, he has to go to practice, which is just his own friends tackling him, or at least roughing him up a bit. Even not getting tackled, even just having a guy jog into you every day is crazy. Imagine that. Even an easy day for an NFL player, even if Joe Flacco does a whole practice where they're like, don't tackle Joe. Just if you break through the line, touch him. Touch like touch him in a way that we can tell you would have tackled him. That that's fine for this practice. We're not gonna hurt our starting quarterback. Okay, so okay. So then yeah, these guys break through the line and then they jog up and they still kind of push him, you know, they just make contact with him. Imagine if you were in your office and every day five guys that worked in the office at the behest of the manager just jogged into you, just like, just, it would, you would go home and you would kind of feel your pecs a little more. You'd be like, yeah, I feel a little bruised, you know what I mean? I feel a little strained. And that's just an easy day. And so, you know, I mean, being a 45-year-old NFL quarterback and a 24-year-old aspiring, not successful, aspiring podcaster are very similar things because no matter what, you got to get up and you got to take the hits and motherfuckers are going to come at you and try and tear you down and you can't listen to them. So 
you know, that's what the fuck you got to do. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, uh, La Jolla was fun. I think I talked about uh, going there on the podcast before this. I went there, and I enjoyed it a lot. That was a wonderful way to do stand-up comedy. Um because the club in La Jolla, it's, a, it's another comedy store, and it and it's just as good as the comedy store in Hollywood. It's uh, it's great. It's just one room, but it's just kind of a perfect room. The crowds are perfect. Everybody who works there is great, and it was wonderful. It was small, and the best thing was is it was fucking .4 miles away from the hotel. So you know what that means is that Daddy gets to walk from his pretty close to the beach hotel uh to the club which was great because I got a I got a little walk-in and you just you know it just feels simple you're like I stay in this room and then I walk out of this room and I walk to that club and I perform stand-up and I get paid and that makes me feel good you know I was staying in a in a very nice hotel actually it was one of those things where it's like it's not I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was fancy but it was just nice like they took all the money they had to make the hotel that they could, and they did it wonderfully. They spent so within their means that nothing seemed uh, gaudy or extravagantly uh, cheap or, like, desperate. You know what I mean? Like, you know when you go to a hotel and they try and make it look really nice, and in your head you're like, you guys didn't have enough money to make this a nice hotel. You shouldn't have tried to make it this nice because you can see right through it, you know? You go in and you, like touch a part of the wall or some railing. You know, like, this isn't real metal. This is plastic that's painted like metal. Why didn't they just get, like, a wood or something they could afford that is nice on its own but just costs less? This hotel said, yeah, fuck it. We're we're going to do everything we can to the extent that we can do it in a way that is comfortable and is not desperate looking. And they did that, and it was great. And it was a very nice hotel. It was called the Inn by the Sea I will say, bit of a sneaky name, because it's it's definitely not on the water or on the sand. I think there's a street, a street or two in between the hotel and the sea. I will say, I did get an ocean view room, which I was excited about, and that was that was okay. It What it amounted to was a view of, I want to say, one or two blocks, and then the ocean. So you could see it, but also when you're looking at the ocean, you're also looking past several buildings where people might be looking out the window and thinking to themselves, is that guy looking in our building? Which was my immediate. I was like, well, this doesn't, this is odd. I'm surrounded by a lot of windows here to the point that, you know, you just feel like you're you're some subject in a rear window movie, you know, like you're being watched. I'm not really making it sound that nice, but I had a great time. Uh, I had a good time. And it was good because it was like a, it was more of a comedy crowd. They were coming because they enjoy stand up. Some of them were obvious fans of Eric, which is great. Um, so it was a little different than other gigs that we've done because, you know, a lot of clubs, they're not, the comedy store is a specific place. People come there and they feel like they are going to somebody. I like to think the vibe that I get is that a lot of people, at least the good audience members, feel like they're almost going to somebody else's house where they're like, well, we're going to eat whatever they serve us for dinner and, and we'll appreciate it. You know, Maybe it'll be a little different. Maybe it'll be something we wouldn't usually try. Maybe we get a Cooper Lydon on our plate. We'll try him out as an appetizer before our main course. And I like that perspective. It's very nice. It's very giving. Sometimes you go to a club that is not in a comedy market and there's not a lot of clubs around. The people there, it's probably their first comedy show. They're not acquainted with comedy. And what it feels like for me is that I have then walked into their house and I have to prepare some kind of meal that they will enjoy. That seems like that's what they want, where they're like, well, you came over here, so what do you have to show us? Like they're a tribunal of kings. Uh, but I, I honestly, I don't think that's as true as that is what's in my head. But it definitely does feel like, like at the comedy store, I felt like I could have more fun. And it can kind of be like, hey, you know, Put put your put your condescensions away. We're at the comedy store, you know, which feels good. That's a be- I like that feeling. That's why I like working at the comedy store in Hollywood. I'm comfortable there. Obviously, I like it. I'm comfortable. But what I mean is, I like it because 
you know, it just feels like you could kind of be yourself and be a little wild because it's like it's like, you know, people coming in and you're like, this is the show. This get used to it. This is this is fun. You know, people say wild stuff. I'm your first comic. Strap in. It really sucks the other way when you show up and you're like, all right, I'm going to try and not upset you guys. How's everybody doing? Did your favorite college football team win? Okay, now that we're past that, will you listen to me? And they're like, maybe. And then they don't, you know. So, I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's what's up. Um, I don't know. So I had a, I had a good time. I'm not, uh, I got to get better at talking to people. It was an interesting situation at the club because there was a green room, but it was more of a converted closet, uh, which is fine. It was a pretty good converted closet, I'd say. They got a mirror, they got the lights, they got two couches. There's room to sit, you know. There wasn't like much in there, but of course, because it wasn't meant to be a green room. But it was weird because like, I know a lot of the door guys that work down there. Some of them are, uh, you know, uh, my age and stuff, and they're all nice people and they're comics and we're all on equal footing. Um, I just happen to be coming in from out of town and I'm with this headliner. And so I was trying to hang out with him, uh, but then also I'd get high and I'd feel weird and then I'd sit in the green room, but then I'd sit in the green room and I'd be like, do those guys think I'm like sitting in here because I don't like them? And because I think I'm better than them, and so I'm sitting in the green room to act like I'm better than them, that I'm in here, and I'm on the show, and they're not, or something. I hope they don't think that. God, I hope they don't think that about me. And chances are, um, that's not that's not what they thought at all. Chances are they just were doing their job, and then they would see me, and then sometimes they wouldn't see me. And they probably would never think about where I was. That would be odd if people that I didn't really know that well um, and have no reason to care about me would at any point be like, where'd he, where'd he go? Where'd that dog go? But I was doing a lot of that. I don't know. The not drinking has uh, honestly not had a great effect on anything other than not drinking. Uh, I was kind of having a good run where I was like, yeah, I really enjoy hanging out with everybody I know, and I still do because I just genuinely enjoy the people I know. But now I'm I'm also at a point where sometimes I'm out in public and I'm just like getting high so I can have some sort of vice and smoking a lot of cigarettes and then my throat just hurts a lot and I feel weird and I don't know how to talk to anybody and I'm just like, man, if I was drunk, uh, all of this would make sense. Right now I'm trying to like think out seven different scenarios for every single second and it's not working out well. If I was drunk, I'd be able to walk out here, smoke a cigarette, walk inside, and know exactly where I'm going. Because right now, I'm high. I'm smoking a cigarette. I walk back inside. There is no room in the showroom to sit and watch the show. So it's either go to the green room or enter a group of comics who will all work together and see if they want to talk to me. And then, you know, I'd do that for a little. And then they would disperse to go do their job. Uh, like they should, and then I'd be alone, and I'd be like, well, do I do I stay now? Do I just stand here alone? Or do or do I go back to the green? I don't, you know, I, I envy people that uh, that's not a question for. I think the answer is they're just not really worried about it. They're just kind of like, well, I'll just, you know, I'm the guy on the show. I can stand here, you know. These people know who I am. They're generally nice to me. I have reason to believe they, at the very least, do not dislike me, if not maybe like me. So I can just stand here. That's a level of comfort that somehow I have not reached. And what's funny is that's not even a level of comfort. That's like a pretty just normal, healthy thought pattern. Um, I don't know. I think the not drinking has brought out a lot of anxiety that I was somewhat unaware that I had. And I wouldn't say that the drinking necessarily masked the anxiety because I didn't drink all throughout the day. I would just, you know, I just drink like at night a lot of times. Um, so I'd still have tons of time to be anxious. But I think the fact that there's never any drunk moment means that the anxiety is just, I can just always feel it simmering there. It's just always there. 
And so then you just have moments where you're like, God, this really doesn't go away, huh? And your body's like, no, 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 no. No, we think we're going to die all the time, actually. That's the whole thing with us. We just sort of assume that death is right around the corner. That's kind of the thing about you. So I would just kind of strap in for this or figure out how to fix it. Um, Because if you're not going to drink, that's this is just this is kind of just part of your M.O. Being anxious sucks. It's like the most useless of all uh, the issues you can have with your head, you know. I mean, they're all pretty useless. I wouldn't say they all, if any of them have really good uses. I wouldn't people be like, hey, I don't think there's anybody that's like, you know what the silver lining to borderline personality disorder is? Like, I don't think there's that. But I will say anxiety is just, it's just, I don't know. It, it just shows up and just only causes a problem. And it's not even powerful. Like, at least with something like a, like a bipolar one or a borderline, like, you might just get fully carried away, you know, in sort of a in sort of an episode that you're almost not even in control of. But then with anxiety, it's like you just walk into a room and then and then the anxiety is like not good. Wow, not good. Holy shit, not good. And you're like, we just got here. What do you mean? Everything seems fine. And it's like, I don't think these people like you. And you're like, what people? We're just going to eat alone at a restaurant. This is what people don't like. It doesn't matter if people don't like us. And they're like, they're probably going to watch you eat your food and think the way you eat your fries is inauthentic. You know, there's probably people there that are going to see you sipping on coffee, looking around the restaurant, and they'll probably think that motherfucker thinks he's so cool because he's not on his phone. That's what those people will probably think. So you might just want to get out of this restaurant. I actually, that reminds me, I had a terrible fucking dining experience in San Diego. Because, first off, the Mexican food in San Diego, I'm sorry, it's it sucks. It sucks a lot. It surprisingly sucks. It sucks to a weird extent. And maybe I just haven't tried the good stuff. I don't know. But it sucks a lot to an extent that doesn't fucking make sense to me. They don't just have taco trucks where you can just get, like, nice, wet tacos. Everything is, like, from a stand, and it's dry. And I don't know. They can't make Mexican food hot in San Diego. It seems like you can't get it hot. Every Mexican food I got was, like, just beginning to get cold. Like, it was still warm, but it was on the way to cold. That was how every meal arrived. I went to this one place that was near the La Jolla store, and my friend told me to go to. And I don't think it was actually, I don't know, I guess they won Best Burritos or something. I didn't want a burrito, so I didn't get a burrito. My bad. I got fucking tacos. (laughs) I got the crispy ones, which I don't, you know, I'm not a huge fan, but I was like, these are simple. They can't fuck these up. And they did fuck it up by just being so boring. The worst part of the whole meal was this. This this fucking place has like two tables inside. And then it has an outdoor dining area. And I was sitting outside, and then I went inside to get my order. It wasn't ready yet. I saw one of the tables, which was like a four top, was open. So I sat down in it. And then after I sat down in it, a family of four arrived and then three more families of four arrived all with kids that were like three to six, which also means they are at the eye level of a dining table. And this place is cramped. So I get my food and I'm eating. And then I literally just four separate kids, all three to six at some point stood a foot away from my table and stared at me. Cause they don't know not to stare. They just stared at me and watched me eat my food for a while, and, like, you know, I would look up at them, and I'd, like, smile or do something, you know, to just because I would notice them, and then I didn't want to just stare at them, so I'd be like, hello, you know, and then I'd eat my food. But they would keep staring the way kids do, where you acknowledge them, you go, okay, you're staring at me, hello, hi, I see you, and then they just, they're just like, I'm not going anywhere. It's that you saying hi to me means nothing to me. I will keep staring because I haven't figured you out yet. I haven't seen a guy like you in my life yet. I've never seen a 24-year-old eating alone. That's confusing to me. I can't tell if you're 16 or 50. I don't know what's happening. And they just fucking stared at me. I did not finish my food. I ate about half the meal, which was bad. And I was like, there's nothing keeping me in this restaurant. This food sucks, and this, this child is really staring the fuck out of me. And not with malice or with kindness, just with a face, just with a face that had eyes, just the most raw person you can be, just 
fully just a face with eyes and a mouth to maybe tell their mom about seeing me later. And it is funny because, you know, I've had that happen before. I've had, you know, kids just, you know, stare at me if I eat alone in a restaurant, which sometimes you do, especially doing stand-up. You got time to kill. You're hungry. It is funny because you remember being a kid and looking at guys eating alone, and you would think, man, those guys look weird. Those look like weird guys. What's up with them? Why are they eating alone? I got a whole family. Where's his family? They look so weird. And then I realized, I was like, well, maybe also the reason those guys looked weird is because they were aware that they were being stared at by a five-year-old incessantly. For like just three minutes straight, you were just staring this motherfucker down. And he's just like, God damn it, I'm just trying to get through my fucking lunch break. I hate my life. And this kid's just like, uh. Maybe those why maybe that's why those guys looked fucking weird, you dickheads, okay? Stop fucking staring at people. It also feels like parents are not telling their kids not to stare anymore. That does that seems like that's gone out of the lexicon of parents. No more is a parent turning around and going, hey, stop looking at him, okay? And then looking at me and going, sorry. And I go, oh, it's okay. And then he gets like a little too mad at the kid to a point that almost makes me uncomfortable. That what happened to that? I was keeping things moving, you know? I was keeping kids from being fucking rude because now they're just staring at guys just trying to have a meal before their big set in La Jolla, California. The homeless situation in La Jolla uh, needs work. They're in a they're in an interesting spot. Uh, they have some. They don't have enough. Um, listen, it's either zero or a lot. That's the only way to be able to, to have a livable homeless experience in a city. Because if you have none, that's great. You got none. Nice, nice work. Everybody's got a house or more likely you just kicked them out somewhere else, but you weren't going to help them anyway. So nice stuff. Or you have too many. Which is, uh, which, is, which is not good because you have a lot of people on the street that are dying. Here is the plus is they are better homeless people. They, uh, they, don't, they either won't ask you for money or if they do, they're keeping it brief. They're not telling you a story. Listen, you go down to La Jolla, there's like four homeless guys, which means those people are not talking to enough homeless people. So those motherfuckers are down there chatting your ear off about how they used to be at Camp Pendleton, and about how things are not going well. And I'll give any motherfucker a dollar. I don't even, you don't even need to be homeless. If you need a dollar and come up and ask me for a dollar, I'll probably give you a dollar. I don't, I don't need to read the Riot Act. I've talked about this on other podcasts. Old white people have convinced homeless people that they have to have some sort of Disney story that explains why they're an amazing person and actually shouldn't be homeless. For them to deserve. I don't need that. You can you can be the worst person in the world. I was there, saw, you know, a couple homeless guys. They all talked to me. I walked past one homeless guy. He said, Could I buy a cigarette from you for my friend? And I said, No. Uh, which kind of negates the thing I said about the dollar. I didn't uh I wanted to go get food and not stop and give this guy a cigarette. Um I was just so conf- I was also just I think I didn't love the question. I didn't love the question, how it was presented, what I thought it could mean. Can I buy a cigarette for my friend? You're a homeless guy. You're telling me you don't want a hit of that cigarette? You're also telling me you got money to burn on cigarettes? If you have a dollar, keep the dollar. If you get two dollars, you might be able to get food. Keep the dollar. Chances are you're expecting me to just give it to you for free. I'd rather you just say, can I have a cigarette? That, that to me is a lot like, I know what that means and I can, you know, we can get that done. Now with your friend, there's a cash transaction involved. You got this whole operation. And so I just said no. And then when I walked away, he goes, I really can't buy a cigarette for my friend. And I was like, see that, that second, that, that last little, hey, I so I really, I, you're really going to say no right now, dude. That last thing was, um, that's what you get with the homeless population of five guys in one city. Okay? They're spoiled bra- <laughs> They're not spoiled, but uh boy do they boy do they have a goddamn attitude problem. 
Um, that's a terrible thing to say. Homelessness is awful. There's a friend of mine right now, or at least a guy that I used to know and liked a lot, and now he's fucking homeless. And um, I'm going to try and find him again and see if he would accept any kind of help if I could try and get the money together to get him a plane ticket home or if I could help him get a place to live out here or something. But uh, it's fucking crazy, man. Like, cause you start comedy when you're young, and you're like, you know, I bet there's gonna be some 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 real sob stories of people I consider friends right now in the future. And in your head, you're like, you know, I bet they just won't make it. Maybe live in an apartment, Van Nuys, be a little bitter, call me sometimes. I don't really want to talk to them. That's also assuming I'm gonna be successful. I don't. Sorry, I'm the guy in Van Nuys. But you know, you assume that'll happen to you or somebody, you know. Um, and you kind of joke maybe about the homelessness thing. You don't really think that's going to happen. And then it does. And you're just looking at a person whose life is so off the rails. And this guy didn't do drugs or anything. You know, he was he was living in his car and he got beat up. And I think that's had mental, uh, I think he might have brain damage. I think he might be traumatized. Um, you know, and you just, you don't expect something so awful to happen so quickly. Because this guy's still young, you know. Um I saw him. He looks like a fucking homeless guy in a movie. Like, he's wearing a sweater inside out. Like, I don't know why that's the move, but he's on that, you know? So I saw that, and I was like, God damn. Sweater inside out. That's got to be fixed, you know? Um, yeah, now this guy's just out here, and he's just from a small town in, like, South Carolina or something, you know? And he's got a family, and if we could get him back to them, that would maybe be good. But also where he's from isn't good. It's tough, too, you know, because you're just you look at that and you're just like, you know, I don't know how much I can help this situation. I I will try and talk to my friends that are also concerned about him and see if we can pull something together for him. But, you know, it's not as simple as, hey, just get this guy a house, you know. It's just not. And and who knows what else is fucking going on with him if he's picked up any other bad habits being out there. That happens, you know. That's a ter- I hope he doesn't. I don't think he has, but I really hope he doesn't touch any drugs because that what happens to guys is a lot of people start drugs after they become homeless. Some shit happens, like what happened to this guy. And then you're out there and you feel terrible and you're like, ah, fuck it. So you do some, you know, you do some drugs, you have bad influences around you. And then, then the, then the problem becomes like 20 times harder than it was to solve before. It is, it's just funny because I think it's, it's a, sort of a rude and rose-colored glasses way to look at homelessness as just, well, they're just a person without a home. And it's like, no, people are complex. This is a person who has been through a lot, maybe has done some bad things, made some mistakes, maybe in the case of my friend hasn't done any bad things, but has, has, chances are all of them, whether they've done anything wrong, have been through a lot. They've simply been through a lot to the point that You can't just put them in an apartment and be like, have a great time in the new home. There they need to go to therapy. You know, they need to, they have a lot of work to do before they get back to the point of just me, of just a regular depressed guy with the house. Even I am years of work away for a a regular guy on the street to get back to the point where you are, have the luxury of just waking up and being unhappy in a bed years of work you know which is also the thing is like just because you give a homeless guy a house doesn't mean he's going to start playing the upright bass amazingly and everything's going to be perfect you know like that guy's capabilities might still just be that of an arby's general manager which is fine because that's a lot better than being homeless but yeah just an interesting thing life is like the the it really is banal the evil that they talk about, the banality of evil. It really is banal. When you see truly awful things happen in the world, it's just, it's just, it's like it doesn't have sharp edges to it. It's just like this amorphous, awful blob that just sort of sometimes sucks up somebody you love, you know? Because it's, you know, it's not like what happened to this guy is... I, you know, I don't know. It's just so, it all just seems so pointless. It's like he just came out here to do a good thing or at least an, an, uh, an honest, you know, innocent, not hurting anybody thing, just wanted to do stand up and was really good at it and had early success, a lot more success than I've had. 
and then what? Just get just lives on the street because he doesn't want to burden his friends with a couch stay, and then gets his fucking ass beat. And I I don't know. I guess loses his car and also now has a traumatized mental state to the point that he's no longer the guy I knew, huh? That's how that that's how that happens, and that is aggressive and awful. Somehow to me, it's still just banal in the in the way that it's just like. What do you mean those are the circumstances? Like, you get told that story, and you're like, what do you mean that's the story? What do you mean it's as simple as that? And it's probably not. There's a lot of things going on. He might not even be living on the streets. He might have some sort of place to stay, but he's sort of half and half where he can't really get a job anymore. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe he still has a car. I don't know. But, yeah, it's just it's just fucked up. Because you wonder how people become homeless out here and then one of your friends becomes homeless and you're like wow so that's how and I can already you know I see I've spoken to him and he's he's not the same as he was I don't know if he could hold down a job for himself um I you know I talk to him and he talks like a homeless guy now he talks like a guy that I've given money to on the street he's beginning to talk like that he's like the young version of like an old homeless dude and you just look in his eyes and you're like, this is how it starts. Holy fucking shit. It's not even just, this is it. We're started. You know? And then it's like, fuck, well, I have a studio apartment. Do I ask this guy if he wants to sleep on my floor? And from what I've heard is he would say no, because that was the first issue. Is he was sleeping in his car and his friend said, you can live with me. And he was like, no, it's good. And then he, he got his ass beat. And now I think he sort of changed in such a way that Getting him back inside is, you know, tough. You know, and I, he's not not mean or violent. He's still a sweet guy. He's just fucking fucked up now. It's like, what the fuck are you supposed to do, you know? It just sucks, because this guy really could have, you know, really could have been a famous comedian. I, I really mean that. He was, like, on his way. He had a lot of heat. He was signed to a good agency. And shit just got fucked up. And it just gets fucked up quick especially with agencies and stuff, is like, that's what happens before you get become homeless. You start fucking up a little, you know? I think he was a little late to meetings. And once again, he wasn't on drugs or anything. He was just, you know, he was just a simpler kind of guy from, you know, he's just a simpler guy. And uh, I'm not saying he had, he might have had a little stuff. I don't know. He was a simpler guy, though. He just wasn't organized. You know, he wasn't good at getting the guy to a fucking meet. He's, you know, if you sign a kid like this that's from a small town in, in the Carolinas, he doesn't know about Hollywood business stuff. You got to get him a chaperone that'll at least call him and say, hey, man, you got to get up today. We got a thing at 10. Do you want me to pick you up? Can you get there yourself? Okay, just making sure you get You need that. And they didn't give that to him. And then when he missed his meetings, they fucking drop him from the agency. So now it's like your industry is fucked up because you've been dropped by one of the biggest agencies. And if that happens, other agencies don't really want to touch you. So now it's like before you're even homeless, maybe everything's still good. You just now the industry part of your career is pretty fucked up. Then snowball effect. Now you're, you know, digging fucking out of trash, you know. And I'm just staring at him like, damn, I'm not half as funny as this guy. I'm just lucky, you know. And then on the other hand, I'm not even as lucky as other people. So it's like, God, who really gets it? You know, who makes it? Because there are just so many different fucking reasons why. I and so many other people probably won't, you know? And it's like, I guess I'm lucky that my version of not making it will probably just be a pretty pathetic nothing life. That guy's life, I you couldn't really call it a pathetic nothing life. You call it a really tragic life, you know? I'm just lucky to at least be pathetic. There's a luxury in being pathetic. There's a luxury in just laying in bed all day. It's It's evident in the description the luxury of it so i don't know that was fucking awful um i'm sorry to end the podcast that way i don't really have anything else to talk about i think it'd be pretty tough to bring up something funny right now um and i don't really want to make any jokes about it because uh frankly that's not really the inclination that i have but uh uh yeah things are not uh great but i'm still lucky to have the life i have and I'm even very lucky to have uh, five of you guys listen to this, so I appreciate that. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next week.